Thank you for such a generous uh, introduction. You know, sometimes when, when people read like bios, I hadn't, I forgot I did all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I really did, I really did. Because you know, the years go by and uh, you are where you are, but sometimes you forget about the past that, that actually got you here. And so the Metropolitan Museum, I had to be like, nine, like you know, I was, I was, you know? And so for many of you in here, I'm sure the years go by, you forget you, you did things, but you're here because you did those things. You know, and so it's, it's I, I didn't mean to give a proverb, but. <laughs> but, um, but thank you for your warm welcome and, and thank you to the entire school. Thank you for the staff. Thank you for just, you know, getting me here. Thank you, uh, Adam, for, for, you know, just getting me here and, and being on it in ways that we'll talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a moment. And so uh, at, at the Getty, what I'm charged with is, is founding, so I work at the Getty's research library. A lot of people don't know that the Getty actually has a research library. And so people think of the Getty Museum, people think, uh, but that's basically it, I was going to say, um, or Getty Images. And so the GRI is, is basically one of the premier art history libraries uh, in the world. Uh, and I was hired to found their collection in African American archives. Meaning that, uh, you know, when you go to, uh, I, who am I talking to? I knew you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And so, um, and so yes, and so um, the Johnson Publishing Company, it's one of the, if not the, it is, and so we acquired primarily the uh, photography archive of 70 some odd years of the Johnson Publishing Company. Uh, two Pulitzer Prizes, 55 staff photographers, over 200 freelance photographers. Uh, it is one of the premier photography collections in the world and one of the uh, most important American photography collections in, in the world, world. So you talk about rarity, it's really there because it went bankrupt and it no longer exists. And so we're talking about a company that existed in the past, but really doesn't exist in the past because what we have here are representations of what they've done over the years, and I'm just here to talk about that. And so uh, the first slide is, is from John H. Johnson, who uh, on a loan of $500 uh, built an empire. Beginning in the uh, 1940s, we're dealing with uh, a moment here where there weren't many uh, African-American, well, there were African-American periodicals, but there was not uh, mainstream. The main, so the main, in terms of mainstream press, mainstream publications, African-Americans were seen through a different kind of lens. And so what does it mean to be in charge of your own self-fashioning, of the ways in which you want your children to see you? of the ways in which you want the future of your community. So representation matters. And fundamentally, that's what this uh, uh, presentation is. And so here, John H. Johnson, looking back on what he did from 1975, right? Looking back, says, Ebony was founded to provide positive images for blacks in a world of negative images and non-images. It was founded to project all dimensions of the black personality in a world saturate, saturated with stereotypes, right? And so sometimes, you know, the stereotype reaches the world before you do. So the Johnson Publishing Company was actually an effort to correct that. From 1942 to 2016, the, J the Johnson Publishing Company, or the JPC, published 12 weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly periodicals including its flagship publications, Ebony and Jet magazines. And it had a whole book division. And so the book division was filling, was basically filling, he and Lerone Bennett, their um, head historian, uh, it, was, it was made to actually fill the hole in terms of what is deep black history. And so it wasn't just the popular uh, publications, it was, but it was actually about creating African American history, right? And so two, two, two purposes there. Founded by John H. Johnson in Chicago, the JPC and its publications like Negro Digest, as well as uh, Ebony and Jet, focused on the African American community, its culture, and achievements. During a period of American racial segregation, the mainstream media did not cover positive, the positive attributes, achievements, and contributions of African Americans to American society, or their communities at all on a regular basis. Because of this forced invisibility, African Americans turned to and vigorously supported JPC publications for 75 years. Ebony Magazine, for, uh, as an example, 
at its high point had garnered more than 1.3 million readers at its height of popularity. Against the cultural and legal backdrop of Jim Crow, Ebony addressed African American personalities and interests in a positive and affirming matter, manner. My parents are from Alabama, and they were raised within the often heated context of lawful, lawful segregation in the South. And the JPC provided important counter narratives of African American entrepreneurial progress and cultural exceptionalism. JPC publications also surveyed a wide span of important cultural moments by documenting key instances in American history that changed how we think about ourselves as a nation. Let's go back. So here we see an image of Al Jolson in one of his movies. His most famous movie, I guess, was The Jazz Singer of 1927, one, one of the first American uh, films in sound. Think about that, going from no sound to sound in movies. It's, it's, it's bigger than Avatar, that's just 3D. <laughs> right? We're dealing with sound. And here we have this relic personality of the minstrel, this sort of imaginary figure of African Americans who uh, comes from vaudeville and that kind of performance, but here we see it entering movies. And so when you think about African Americans in movies during this particular moment, you're dealing with a lot of offshoots of minstrelsy. And here we see this tradition which has its very beginning in American, uh, in American theater, right? And, and so here we see it in movies. And so what was the JPC going against this kind of history? Almost every, almost every, every city had its minstrel group. And what did these minstrel groups go around doing? They went around the world. And so when it came to, you know, how the world understood African Americans at this particular moment, it was through, often through a minstrel lens. Again, something that greeted you before you were even there. And so what does it mean to build a counter narrative to this industry, right? This industry of representation. Well, let's, let, let's go to the images to find out. When Coretta Scott King met her future husband, Martin Luther King Jr. in 1952, they were both students in Boston. He was pursuing his doctorate in theology at Bo uh, Boston University while she pursued her degree in voice and piano from the New England Conservatory of Music. The couple married in June 1953 and in 1954, they moved to Montgomery, Alabama where she continued to perform. In this photograph, Coretta Scott King sings with Harry Belafonte and Duke Ellington in December 19, uh, and Harry Belafonte. The month and year of the Montgomery bus boycott uh, that it ended. Media around the boycott introduced the Kings worldwide as global leaders of social justice and civil rights. But they also became popular cultural uh, icons, connecting celebrities such as Belafonte and uh, Ellington to the ongoing struggle for civil and human rights. In November 1945, two months uh, following uh, the end of World War II, Ebony launched, uh, had launched to document a uh, particular worldview on the American dream and a new hope and vision for the nation. That year, Animated by the confidence and optimism of veterans, African Americans began making more ardent demands for democracy as the armed forces returned from war. Between 1945 and 1951, the year JET launched, calls for democracy and fair rights began changing the nation's laws as they efforted. The Supreme Court made decisions on several key cases, uh, including Morgan versus Virginia, 1946, ruling that segregation in interstate travel by bus in Virginia was unconstitutional. Now, this is important because the Freedom Riders, right, in 1961, were also protesting for the rights for, inter for integrated interstate travel. And so this ruling in 1946 uh, uh, Echo uh, was was an echo for the Freedom Riders who were trying to do uh, tr who try who were trying to actually force the Kennedy administration to actually put those things into law further in practice. 
and Shelley, uh, excuse me, Shelley versus uh, Kramer in 1948 and Hurd versus uh, Hodge in 1940, uh, same year, 1948, the court, the court nullified restrictive housing covenants. In the case of Henderson versus the United States in 1950, the court ruled against segregated dining cars on trains. And in Sweat versus, uh, excuse me, Painter in 1950, the court ordered that uh, Heman Sweat, an African-American law uh, school uh, applicant, be admitted to the University of Texas Law School after the university tried creating a separate but equal law school for black applicants. In this case, the court found the law school for Negroes unequal in several key areas, including a smaller faculty and library, course variety, and few opportunities for legal writing, which would keep black students from fair and equally uh, competing for opportunities in the field, such as jobs and uh, uh, internships and the like. This period of uh, challenging Jim Crow segregation laid the groundwork for what later became the modern civil rights movement. This is maybe Mo, uh, excuse me, Mamie Mobley Till, the mother of Emmett Till. For those of you who don't know the story of Emmett Till, Emmett Till was one of Chicago's most brightest young black men, around 14 years old. And you know, when I was a kid, my parents would send me back to Alabama to meet my family, right? The extended family, the roots of the family in the South, that I would you know know who my cousins were down there and uh, I'd be familiar with just the stories that I could take on to other generations, right? And so Emmett Till, Chicago, Mississippi and Chicago have this very tight thing. If you study the blues, uh, a lot of Mississippi musicians went up to Chicago and made what? The electric blues, right? Later popularized by, popularized by Jimi Hendrix and, and things like that. And so here we have Mamie Till, uh, Mobley, and she sends her son Emmett to the South, to Money, Mississippi, to learn who his family was and to be around them. Now, some people say, well, uh, you know, that's kind of crazy. Why would you send a 14-year-old to see his, why wouldn't you send a 14-year-old to see his family? That's also the contradiction in it, right? It said, you know, that, that well, it later came out to be false that um, Carolyn Bryant, the, the woman, the white woman who owned the store, said that he really didn't do it. But he said that he whistled at her, something happened. He blinked his eye, and then later her husband and his uh, uh, friends went to uh, the house that Emmett was staying in, his uncle's house, and dragged Emmett out in the middle of the night, kidnapped him, uh, tortured him, and murdered him, and threw him in the Tallahatchie River. His mutilated body, when it was pulled out of the river, I you can go on Google and see the image, it's, but it's a traumatic, triggering image, and it's very popular at the same time, and I wonder why it's so popular, but you can look at it on your phone if, if you can Google it, right? But here we see the pain, and what she did, which was really brave. What she did was that she said, I want the world to see what they did to my son. Where did she choose to publish those images? In Jet Magazine. She chose to have those, she had an open casket to see what the world had done to her child and she published and they went around the world. And so this is another source of the modern civil rights movement. After this in around 1956, a 26, 27-year-old Martin Luther King began the Montgomery bus boycott. A child himself, almost, 26, 27, right? Here's an image by Moneta Sleet Jr., one of the most important photographers, I would say, of the 20th century, but a staff photographer uh, at the Johnson Publishing Company. This photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. in the center, the president of the newly formed Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Roy Wilkins to, uh, to your right, my left, vice president of the National Labor Union, the AFL-CIO, uh, appears uh, to be an image taken from the, mar the March on Washington when it's really from uh, the March for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. In May 1957, at a lesser known uh, pilgrimage, uh, excuse me, uh, for freedom, these, two, these three also gathered then as well. With demonstrators uh, representing more than 30 states gathering in DC, five months following uh, other protests, here we see Monetta Sleek Jr. 
capturing these three men where at the Lincoln Memorial. A sight of what democracy is, right? And here we see Moneta Sleet Jr. at the funeral of Martin Luther King Jr. Coretta Scott King, his widow, and their daughter Bernice in his lap. Some stories about this, this image. For 13 years as a photographer for Ebony, Sleet chronicled pivotal moments in Dr. King's life. He was there in 1955 when King organized the Montgomery bus boycott, in 1964 when King won the Nobel Peace Prize, and in 1968 when King was mourned at Atlanta's uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church. When Coretta Scott King discovered that the press pool covering her husband's funeral included no black photographers, she alerted everyone that if uh, Moneta Sleet was not allowed into the church and given a choice, a vantage point, there would be no photographers at all. The iconic photograph here Sleet took of Mrs. King and her daughter and their daughter, Bernice, was such a powerful image that it transmitted nationwide. It was, was sent out nationwide by the Associated Press. Sleet became the second African American to win a Pulitzer Prize because of this photograph. The first, um, the first was Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet. And so for me, this, this, is, this is so important to recognize that this is not just for popularity, that there's a politics behind this, an ethic behind this. And that if Life Magazine is not hiring African-American photographers for some reason, if these other periodicals aren't hiring, then there has to be a place for this brilliance. And here, the intimacy of it, right? The intimacy of it. Why these figures would allow these photographers in their life, it, it was trust that he's right there as she's mourning and the child in her lap and he, he takes this picture because he understands that he's been with the family for so long. Key to Ebony's success were the photojournalists, was the photojournalists who documented and communicated cultural symbols and values through images. They produced decades of visual commentary on black life and achievement to redefine photojournalism and reflect how black communities saw and imagined themselves. Through unique visual voices and uh, cultural lenses, these photographers also chronicled the trials and tragedies. And to look beyond the image's surface to find true humanity. Behind each ebony photograph or each photograph from the JPC, I'd say, is a photograph, there's a life and a story that gives each image its value and meaning. John Johnson would say, few magazines dealt with blacks as human beings with human needs. Fewer magazines dealt with the whole spectrum of black life. It was, for example, rare for radio, newspapers, and magazines, other magazines, to take note of the fact that black people felt, fell in love, got married, participated in, organized their communities for activities. Johnson Publishing photo uh, photographers led the way by picturing their subjects with intimacy. Here, Moneta lead again with Eartha Kitt and her daughter, Eartha. Important moments received in-depth coverage from the company's bureaus around the country. Within each photograph, there exists intimacy between photographer and subject on a, and on a smaller scale that conveys the feeling of unguarded poise and ease. These images are simultaneously iconic and personal. In January 1961, Ebony Magazine published an article about Illinois native Miles Davis who would become a great mentor to John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, and many others. That alongside the, Musco the Montgomery bus boycott and other activities for, again, human, human and civil rights, you have the company publishing stories that accompanied uh, 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 articles that captured a more human scale. And here we see Miles in meditation. If anyone you've read anything about Miles Davis, he was very, a very peculiar, 
pick, he was a picky person. And if you were around him, he, he chose you to be around him because this, he's unguarded. He's unguarded and he's in that moment where he's listening to the band play and he's getting ideas, sketching in his mind. And here he invites Monetta Sleep Jr. in to take this photo. Behind the walls of segregation and self-doubt, they attempted to impose on black lives that there is this grace within the mundane and rapture amidst, amidst quiet and solitude. In Maurice uh, Sorrell's photograph of Benjamin Mays, uh, for example, uh, from Temple, from his temple to his shoulder, and he's the former president of Morehouse College. From his temple to his shoulder, like confers the former Morehouse president with a resonant wisdom, regality, and acuity. His poise is as stalwart and synonymous with enlightenment as the texts that surround and inform his life. As Johnson again has said, we believe then and we believe now that image power is a prerequisite to economic and political power. Minetta Sleet, David Jackson, Isaac Dutton, and many other JPC photographers played important roles in Johnson's vision of producing ennobled and representative imagery. Here we see Shirley Chisholm, Congresswoman, and the first black woman to run for president. Here we see how she's being positioned, right? In front of the Capitol. But that hat kind of echoes that dome, right? It's kind of a one-to-one -one relation. And here we see the intelligence of how to pose someone to symbolize their ambitions, to symbolize what they're thinking about. Here we see Gwendolyn Brooks, Chicago's own, uh, the first uh, uh, Pul uh, Pulitzer Prize, black person to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and, you know, uh, so they, they, these photographers are in all of these, all their lives. And here she is, you know, just reading, right? Just reading, right? Which was once illegal. Oh, did I, did I, did I mention that, that even reading, African Americans reading, was illegal at one point? by death or imprisonment by, by those who owned them, right? And so an image like this with an understanding of, of deep history can give one perspective about why the politics. In a duet between the photographer's lens and the trust bestowed upon them by their subjects, there exists a psychological closeness due to their unique proximity that no other publications matched. The golden moments of melancholy and contemplation exemplified by here Sleet's photograph of Billie Holiday. With her head tilted, her chin cupped gently in her palm, and her attention traveling elsewhere. These photographs pull warmth from the image's grayscale, and in the distance between the camera and the subject's contem uh, contemplative presence, empathy walks along with this meaning, oh, excuse me, this meaningful exchange. Who would one allow in the room as subjects sing the praises of their souls? Who would one trust to witness, to witness such vulnerability? If lives could be sung, these photographs capture the beauty of the song while reminding us of the solace of kin and the importance of sovereignty over one's self. Here we see Sidney Portier playing, I believe, with his daughter and Maya Angelou reading in bed, as we all do with the books around, and uh, maybe a coffee cup somewhere. Right, maybe. Poet and, and author Maya Angelou writing in bed with books lying in idle orbit around her. Things too often denied, the descendants of the enslaved flush with introspection amidst acts of self-care and solemnness. Here the intimate lives of public figures are braided into an everydayness synonymous with our own striving, sorrow, joy, and peace. 
all together, brought together by a cultural trust. There are rooms we will never see here and spaces, if only in, in our minds, we will never lay, ba uh, ne never lay bare uh, witness uh, to any kind of public, uh, public consumption. What remains is a legacy of respect for the sanctity of black life. Angelou put it this way, Ebony arrived in 1945 to inform us and assure us that our lives were so important they could never be edited out of the history of our people, of this nation. Or as John H. Uh, Johnson put it, we felt in 1945 we, and we feel now that our story, the story of our hopes and hurts, the story of our dreams and agonies and triumphs is one of the most eloquent and important stories in the world. We felt that, that in 1945 and we feel it now. The story is central to the meaning and redemption of America. I spent my first week at the Getty on the road with Dr. And this, and this is the, the, and so. So I spent a week in Chicago going through all of the, the archive to make the case for acquisition, to make the case to save it. One of the major um, fears was that a, some kind of advertising firm would, would buy it and then just take the iconic pictures and put the rest away and, and not be seen. Uh, I guess some of you not again, you know, the, the, the rare books, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, I'm going through all the file cabinets I can. There's a baker's box for almost every moment in, these are the large files. And so even Emmett Till has, has a box in terms of, so every photograph I showed you was part of maybe several contexts. And those particular ones were by the editor's circle that said, this one's good for publication. So that's good. good. But there's so many more. So even for the iconic moments that instead of say Emmett Till, there are contact sheets around the moment that his body came to Chicago. There are all the images around his mother insisting in Muddy, Mississippi, walking around. There, and, and so what I'm seeing in this archive is basically the 20th century from African-American lex. And so and this is where research matters. From box to box, I can identify and understand the importance of every particular subject, right? And so, write reports, and send them up the chain, and eventually the archive was saved by four foundations, Getty Foundation, Mellon Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, and the, let's say four. She, yeah, we're in. And she did, but, 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 I mean, bad Steve, I'm not lying. Right. <laughs> and so you can imagine, it felt like, it felt like a great library. You know, you hear about the Greek and Roman, it felt like the brain, it felt like you're, you're entering the status, and you think if there was something there. At every particular level, for those of us who just love stacks, who love going through and spending your time there, and there's a, there's a solace in the sort of bad sanctity act. And I'm seeing all of this stuff that just could be lost. Everything I just showed you and what it means could have just been lost. Box upon box. Now, when it, so let's say, and so when my first, my first uh, acquisition for, for the library was of Dr. Robert Ferenc Thompson, uh, his archive. And he's one of the premier Africanists uh, in the world, if you've ever heard the term Black Atlantic, his book, Flash of the Spirit, uh, has, is, is one of the sort of foundational books for a lot of artists who are thinking about the African diaspora. By diaspora, I mean uh, he went from Nigeria to the East Coast and then through the Caribbean, uh, and especially through the Southern United States to find continuities, you know, through language, uh, through uh, visual art forms. And so Flash of the Spirit and many of his other uh, texts deal with the, that sort of those connections that if you don't understand the way that maybe a, a Sanufo initiation society dance uh, in Mali connects to the Bronx and break that's vision and take it. Right? That modernity has its beginning in every spot that it appears. That when we think about origins, there really isn't a purity. 
when it comes to understanding modern identity, you have sparked of many original beginnings coming from influences that then influence others, right? So language, you feel the linguist in language clearly, right? Because English is pretty much pidgin language to a certain degree. You have French in it, you have Italian in it, you have African in it, you know, to told something. Where'd that come from? Africa, right? Good. And so here I am, that definitely probably was Frankie John Michel Vassiat, so at the Vassiat painting, and he was showing the P. Herring, the painter, that's T. Herring paint. It was part. Uh, I took this photograph that, uh, you know, it was on the New York Times published it called his uh, obituary. Um, but as I was in his office at Yale, taking, uh, just organizing everything, he was right there. He was right there. Because those books were his laboratory. Every single book. And he was doing research on another book on Mambo. And we ate dinner every night. And you know, I got to learn, I got to know him to a certain degree. But what I realized is that, you know, archives represent the heart of something, of someone. You know, it's great. You know archives are so personal and so human, right? That the loss of an archive, it's almost like the, the the erasure of something so deeply important to identify being that person was they so in the basement, you know, of the JPC offices. It's like a fallen empire. It's not, it's not quite, I may be exaggerating here, but you know, you're an anthropologist, you know, cousin to art history, anthropologist. You know, you dig in the dirt and you find bones and you find pieces of, you know, archaeological materials that is a Greek vase or something and you pull it out. You know, I'm looking at the ends of a bankruptcy, a crumbling, a failure, a ruin. And he thought there's something that I consider him to be a treasure. Right? This, uh, me with uh, Vicki Wilson, she is the, uh, she is the, she's the visual memory for the corporation. <laughs> Meaning everything, every, every jet image, she was surprised. In a movie, in an advertisement, uh, since the early 90s, she's the person who um, gave those to the press. She remembers every photographer. She remembers almost every image, right? And so really unique people work there. And here we are in the basement. Just, it displeased some of my colleagues. And so we co with the archives with the National Museum of African American History and Culture in uh, DC. So I'm co-curator of the archive with a curator at, at NIMA. And we're just done that. Eunice Johnson, uh, Johnny Johnson's wife, began fashion fit. You know, if you flavor like Rihanna and Fifty, you know, the colors, you know, for, you know, women of color, it was this revolutionary to a certain group of fashion fair was one of the only makeup companies that made colors for women of color, right? And so when she became a, like part of the empire. They went on uh, a runway show with models and clothes. And so that's a whole other aspect to, to the company. And here we are, you know, there's maybe some shoes left. You think there's... What? The makeup has been licensed to someone else. The name had been inject as a license, as a cut to publisher, has been sold. Eric Lim. Then. That's Linda Johnson. They're looking at my photographs, my iPhone 6. We can see them. Linda Johnson licensed Johnny Johnson's daughter. She was president of the company for all the way up until the bankruptcy. And here we are uh, in the basement of, of, of what was the Johnson Publishing Company. And she's basically showing us around and, and things like that, you know. Uh, but she's the living legacy of, of the company. That's what Malcolm X's hand by in that book. And I'm just going to go through some of these images. These, these are the images right from the boxes that, that, that I took, right, to give you a sense of what was going on. Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer. And so when photographers went, especially in the 1940s and 50s, when the BC was, you know the Green Book era? The people. Where were they going to stay? They often stayed with the artist, with the person that won Brad Pitt. And so this is a, there's a great picture of Count Basie, the, the pianist, the, the jazz pianist, 
and he has the apron on, and he's at the, the at the stove cooking, and she's right. He has the stove cooking completely informal, but who can get that image? The photographer was living with him as he was doing the the report. And who's he cooking for? Probably the both of them. Megan. And so here we see Mahalia Jackson. And the closeness of this. Who takes a photograph of, of Lena Hall without makeup? <laughs> All right? Who has access to... We're doing the egos here. The fact that... Right? So this is the relationship. Have a fun. Billy Holiday. Now, these are just secrets. And so what we're doing right now is processing 5 million images. 5 million images, right? So we're processing that between our two institutions. It will, it will be available to the public. We're making a whole portal for it uh, in maybe five years. Online. Okay. Just behold this there to addressers. You don't know if through Annie for some reason called. And my did tell the end. It was to Annie Jim and Feathers. You live it. So, and we got a whole lot. Gordon Vance. That's Harry Belfontes' apartment and that painting by Charles White, the African-American uh, artist. Harry Belafonte, he, he, he damaged his eye, but this is his, so you wear sunglasses, people thought he was just trying to be cool, they, they serve two purposes. But this is his office on Sunset. He was also a business. Josephine Baker. Thank you. 